Welcome to the message for Sunday, June 18th, 2023. I'm Pastor Teresa Heiser from the Pens Valley Charge of the United Methodist Church, and we are conducting a mindset inventory series this summer, which means we're taking a look at just two different kinds of mindsets that the church as a body might hold and that we as individuals may hold, just to see which one you think by the end of the message you're leaning toward or the church is leaning toward. Before we go to our scripture for today, I want to share these centering words. This is a day for recognizing that even the everyday miracles of service and healing and transforming have been taking place among you because nothing is too wonderful for God. Before we go into the scripture passages, I do want to go over the mindsets that we're comparing today. Amongst the congregation as a body, do we hold a self-first mindset or an others-first mindset? A self-first mindset says the people whose needs are prioritized are the ones who speak the loudest and give the most. An others-first mindset says the people whose needs are prioritized are the ones who do not yet know Christ. When it comes to ourselves individually, do we hold one of these two mindsets or at least a little closer to one than the other? The first being a follower mindset, where it's safer to blend into the background and follow others. Or a leader mindset, when prompted, I'm willing to risk failure, step out and lead others into new areas of growth. Our first scripture passage comes from Genesis 21, verses 1 to 7. After Abraham and Sarah received news that Sarah shall bear a son in a year's time, the Lord fulfills that promise. When the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised, so Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The second passage is when Paul declares the beauty of the gospel. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is Romans 5 verses 1 to 8. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our final passage, we continue to examine how Christ's first followers live out the call on their lives to change their thinking about their relationship to God and to each other. The disciples were regular people called by Jesus to do what was viewed by the world as pretty irregular things. When Jesus sees the helplessness of his people, he takes a break from ministry to be the good shepherd he is and send out the 12 disciples to respond to that need. Interesting to see the difference between how they do it in the first four Gospels of the New Testament versus the book of Acts and beyond. Hear these words from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, to chapter 10, verse 23. 
Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the houses of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worthy of his support. And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, Shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death you will be hated by all because of my name but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved but whenever they persecute you in one city flee to the next for truly i say to you you will not finish going through the cities of israel until the Son of Man comes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The name of our message today is Mindsets That Create Promise Out of Pain. And we're talking about changing mindsets of those first Christians, the ways that they had to figure out how it is to carry out the very things that Christ calls them to do, how to be a follower of Christ, how to walk in those very important footsteps and do things the way that Jesus has taught them to do. Now, it's important to note that nothing created in the beginning was bad or wrong, but one thing that God did talk about as not being perfect was that he saw man should not be alone. And so God created a helper in the book of Genesis. And then all was very, very good. It's important to note that human nature is not divine nature. 
we can be tricked into believing a lie. The fall of the garden changed what was very good and separated humankind from God. And ever since, God has craved right relationship with us, like that in the beginning, which is why God works to redeem what humans have messed up. And followers of Christ are part of that plan. And part of that plan requires us to think about the mindsets that we hold. If we indeed are to be those who can create promise out of pain, what mindsets do we need to have? So we're going to look at those two mindsets again for both the congregation and ourselves. Congregation, do you have a self-first mindset or others' first mindset? And for us individually, do we have a follower mindset, content to allow others to lead and simply to follow, or do we have a leader mindset, willing to risk failure in order to bring about new areas of growth? Now, the first passage of scripture that we shared from Matthew clearly states that Jesus is so moved by the overwhelming pain and and just suffering that is encountered everywhere that they go, town after town, person after person, that he illustrates the need to address this. You know, there's the desire to go out and to teach and to preach and go into synagogues. And yes, and that's a very important thing. But Jesus intentionally steps back and says, you know what? We need to address this first. And it kind of reminds me of when Jesus encounters the 5,000. And if you remember, Jesus and the disciples were going off to be alone. They were going off on retreat when it just so happened they got to where they were going to have their retreat. And lo and behold, there are 5,000 people there. (laughs) So they felt like they needed to have some time apart. But Jesus was like, wow, these 5,000 people need us more right now than we need our time apart. And so Jesus fed those 5,000 people. You know, as soon as all the teaching was done, it was like, and now these people have to get home. And in order for them to get home, they've got to have the energy and and the strength physically to be able to do it. And so they were fed. So Jesus is very in tune with the fact that human beings need things in order to do well. And certainly to be able to think, to be able to learn, pain gets in the way, right? Pain really can get in the way. And Jesus says to the disciples, the harvest is plenty, the laborers are few, In other words, we've got a huge task of healing before us and look around the room. There are not very many of us. And so we can say that too in the churches. We look around the room. There are fewer of us than there were just so many years ago. And that harvest out there is still huge. We've got more pain and suffering now than before the pandemic. And it seems like the workers are fewer and fewer and fewer. But this is part of their commissioning message as Jesus sends them out because it's actually been the same message for all of us, every Christian believer ever since. It's it's to look around the room. There aren't a lot of us, but there is a tremendous amount of pain and suffering and misdirection out there. And we need to go out there and we need to be speaking the truth of Christ. And we need to be bringing about healing because there are many different ways of healing. And, and I've shared that before. Sometimes healing is simply to heal a bad day by sharing a smile. You know, you don't have one, I'll give you mine. And there is so much suffering right now. There's a great deal. You can't see it always. Sometimes you can, but some of the suffering and pain, people just kind of mask over and you don't necessarily see it. But there's something interesting in this command that Jesus gives. Did you happen to notice that Jesus instructs these Jewish men not to go to the Gentiles, not to go to the Samaritans, but instead they're to go to the Jews. They're supposed to go to the Jewish people. And I find that interesting since they would likely gravitate to the Jewish people anyway, because they are Jews. So it's interesting that that Jesus felt it necessary to make sure they understand, this is where I need for you to go first. Now, because to me, I kind of see that as like telling a five-year-old at the grocery store, now you stay out of that Brussels sprouts aisle and you just stick over there to that candy aisle. You know, it's sort of like, that's where I would be going anyway. And, and so... It's interesting, but there is a reason that Jesus that Jesus would have the disciples go, these 12 men um, go to the Jewish people first, and why it's also the only time you see in the book of Matthew, the disciples referred to as apostles. And it's, it's symbolic of the 12 tribes of the new Israel. The apostles are equipped to carry out 
the same work of Jesus being given the same authority by Jesus to cast out unclean spirits, to cast out diseases, to cast out sickness. And they're sent for the purposes of healing, not correction, healing. And that correction is going to come, but it's going to come from Jesus. It's up to Jesus alone to attend to that in time. But for right now, these 12 men, this 12 man healing crew are going out two by two in order to do the work that is going to capture hearts and minds and imaginations of the Jewish people in the hope that it'll cause a longing to know more about the source of this healing power, which will actually make that correction and teaching a lot more palatable and a lot more easy to digest for them. Now, also being sent means that Jesus is not in this evangelism thing by himself any longer. He's not the only one doing it. He's called and commissioned others to take on specific roles in this ministry. And it's really important to note, this is pretty early on in the disciples' training, but they're they're limited in the scope of what they're going out to do. So another point that I want to emphasize in the passage is the odd restrictions that Jesus places on them before they head out. Now, these are men that are going to be traveling, and they're going to be traveling extremely light, extremely light. No extra clothing or shoes, no money, basically traveling in self-imposed poverty. But it's because they're going to be doing this wonderful work. And Jesus even says, those workers are worthy of the payment that they will get from the people, meaning they will be given these gifts of support along the way. They appear a lot like the three men appeared to Abraham in the heat of the day, if you remember from last week. And they received hospitality, correct? Yes. If you remember when Abraham approached the three men, which was actually God, but approached the three men as he saw three men standing near the tent. It was the heat of the day and he offered all kinds of things. He referred to them as master, meaning he was here to serve them and offered them all kinds of hospitality. And so they were to expect that same kind of hospitality. And they were to stay only with other believers and converts and if they are not shown that kind of hospitality, not to get too down, just leave, just leave. It's okay. Because that inhospitable behavior will have consequences. And it's going to be so much better to not be there when it happens. If you remember, uh, you can imagine one of those apostles showing up in our town. Could you imagine an apostle showing up in your town and healing a sick child. Everybody has known that this child has been sick and everybody's been rallying around them and, and praying and asking God, God, please just heal this child. And someone comes and actually this child is healed in Jesus' name. Do you think that that person's gonna have trouble finding dinner? Do you think that person's gonna have trouble finding a place to stay tonight? Probably not, probably not. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the realities of what they're about to do either. He warns it's going to be difficult, that there's going to be persecution and suffering, saying he's sending them out like sheep among wolves, advising them how to stay alive to complete their task. But the most interesting thought is that they must be, they might, they might actually be hauled in front of secular powers for the healing work that they do. Now, Jesus doesn't say if. He says, when they hand you over, do not worry what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now, I wonder if the disciples, before hearing about that little tidbit, kind of thought that they were really just going on a simple mission trip. They're going to be going to people's homes and, and town to town and nothing more. But to find out that they might be betrayed by those same people that they're going to serve, that they might be... <clears throat> actually called in to some kind of court. And remember, we talked about that discipleship trust fall last week, how sometimes the disciples might have felt like the spotters catching people when they fall. And sometimes they may feel like the one who's falling. And I think that that's certainly a time when you think, oh, I might actually be hauled into a secular court, uh, that you might be feeling like the one who's falling. The commissioning feels more to me like the one willingly falling backward for sure and counting on Holy Spirit to catch them in their need. Now, Jesus essentially says this when he promises that the Spirit of God will be apparent when their courage is gone amid persecution. When their courage is gone, not if, 
when their courage is gone amid persecution. So this first mission of the apostles is for Israel's uh, renewal, to bring about faithful cohesion among the elect people of God when Jesus says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I tell you, you have you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now again, what happens to those among Israel who prefer not to listen to them is akin to the end of Sodom and Gomorrah, as you heard. Not good, all for not welcoming and listening to them. Why would you want to welcome and listen to them? Could it be because they're telling the truth? Could it be because they are bringing you important information that you are going to do best to heed and to listen and welcome? Well, the apostles are going to have to be okay with all of these things whenever they set out. And it's interesting because to do the work of ministry, you do have to be all right with a lot of things. And some of that does sometimes include blowback. And there's this cycle that happens with Israel that you kind of see after you read about Exodus and you kind of see how many times this cycle has repeated itself. And it seems to be, you know, Israel suffers great oppression and God provides a way out because they've been praying to be freed. And then after that way out, um, they're saved, they repent, they rejoice, they enter a new covenant with God, they thrive, they become complacent they suffer oppression. So it seems to be this little cyclical thing that tends to happen. And, and we're now to that point where God is providing a way through these apostles, through Jesus providing this way. And so if they aren't welcoming the people who are there to save them with this message, they're essentially saying no to being saved. Do you know someone who is saying no to being saved? Are you saying no to being saved? To encounter a messenger with good news and yet maintain this unreceptive heart, Israel, when you should know better by now, and certainly human being or even Christian, if you call yourself a Christian and yet you reject the truth of the word of God, that's a no thank you, God you can see yourself out. And that's not good. The reconnection with Israel must come before the cross so that the wider invitation to all nations is possible after the resurrection. You know, God bridged the chasm between God and man by sending his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And has called upon humankind to accept their role as a bridge builder too, between that which is and that which is possible only through Christ. So it should be for us, as it was for Jesus then, impossible to see pain and suffering and do nothing. To say, boy, I really wish someone would do something about that. Remember, you are someone. I am someone. Each of us is a someone. Now, there are plenty of social media keyboard ninjas out there who see pain and suffering, and the way that they deal with it is to pour out their heart in a lengthy diatribe online about how someone should do something. They have no idea they are someone, and that the something might need to be done offline. Um, understand that no one person is called to do everything. No one person is called to solve all the ills of the world. However, everyone is called to do something or to make something possible. You know, some people are very blessed to be able to make connections. They can see a need and they can see this person over here. They can fill that need and actually bridge the, the gap there and make those connections and make something possible. So it's not that we respond individually or as the church that is our quandary. It's how. So it's, it's not if. And it's not when, but how. So often it's how do we do this? How do we begin? And I say the way that Jesus sent out the apostles. Read it for yourself this week and then meditate on it. How are you being directed by Holy Spirit to make life better for someone who may not yet know Christ or may not yet know Christ well? And with that, I want to close the message with a word of prayer. Jesus, our good shepherd, 
You are the promised one of God, the Messiah who came to heal the sick, uplift the poor, bring restoration amidst sin and despair. Give us the eyes to see as you see, ears to hear what you are speaking to us, the compassion to move us toward the need of the world by the power of your spirit. Grant us the courage to continue being sent out to proclaim the nearness of your kingdom, both in word and deed. And forgive us when we shy away from the task that you have for us and turn down an opportunity that was before us that we just didn't recognize at that time. Remind us of the gift which you are for us, a shepherd who came to seek and save the lost, a resurrected savior who conquered sin and death, the Lord of all the earth. And most importantly, be with us, Emmanuel, as we encounter you in the word and announce what we have heard for others. All this we give you thanks for in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. We do have a lot of announcements available on our website at pensvalleyparish.info. Just a note, we have a change um, we did have a cleaning for the Paradise Cemetery um, on Saturday, yesterday, the uh, the 17th, and that will be rescheduled. So as soon as that is rescheduled, we will let you know. But would you please pray for the Boyd Musser family and uplift that family uh, during this uh, difficult time? The Messiah in whom we have hope does not shy away from getting involved in this world. And he taught the disciples to do the same. May you be so inclined. When you leave this message, go with confidence in God's grace and love and mercy. And go ready to proclaim the good news and serve our Lord by caring for others first. It is so important to make sure we are more concerned about being helpful and healing than we are about being right. More on that next week. Amen. Until I see you next time, have a wonderful and blessed week.